right, the doors are open and welcome to folks who are joining us for this webinar. I don't know if you can believe it, but this is week nine of our series. It's sort of a reminder of how long we have been here in quarantine. Um, but we are delighted to um, touch base with our e for all communities across the country every month. Um, I'm Deborah Gallant of e for all Berkshire County. I'm the executive director here, and I am the one who puts together these programs uh, week after week to make sure that we are tuned into how small businesses are thinking about what's going on out there, how we're dealing with it. And uh, we'll get started in just a moment. I'm going to let some more people come on. I do want to tell you that we are recording and uh, hopefully that's good with everybody. I think we're supposed to allow, tell you if you don't, don't want to be recorded, then you can leave now, but I don't know that anyone really leaves. Um, and I want to also thank uh, Vanessa, who is uh, pinch hitting for our friend uh, Casey, who is taking a vacation this week. Casey is like chopping trees down in his backyard. So it's not like he's having fun on his vacation, but he's not here with us this week. I think I'm gonna get started. Um, more people will join us and I'm sure uh, more will watch us as a, we're recording. My name again, Deborah Gallant. I am the executive director of e for all in Berkshire County, Massachusetts. I think most people know what e for all stands for, but I like to always make sure. Entrepreneurship for All is a nonprofit organization that partners with communities nationwide to help under-resourced individuals successfully start and grow their businesses through intensive business training, mentorship, and an extended professional support network. So welcome to e for alls week nine of our weekly COVID coping tactics webinar. We start these with a little centering exercise and Kelly music from our e for all Longmont uh, location, our most far flung location in Colorado, is a wellness person as well as uh, our program manager there. And it's just not my shtick to do centering. So I'm gonna pass it to Kelly for a moment for us all to be present and center and then I'll take it back. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah, and good morning to everyone um, far and wide who is tuning in to this wonderful webinar. Uh, let's just begin by gently closing our eyes. If you don't feel comfortable actually closing them, then just let them be gently, gently open. So just a tiny bit less focus on vision. So close the eyes or let them gently half close and take a deep breath in. As you let that breath out, just naturally flowing out, just notice the breath and notice that you might settle just a little more in the seat that you're in. Notice the breath coming in and out, the cool air in, the warm air out. And shrug your shoulders up just a bit, let them relax back down on that next breath, settling in a little more deeply again to the seat where you are. Noticing the breath just gently in your own natural rhythm flowing in and out. And let that place between your eyes, that brow soften. And the next out breath, just notice how all of the tension can just melt away and you can just be present right here, right now a little more grounded, a little more centered. Take a deep breath in, this time deeper than normal. And relax, letting it out. And open your eyes gently and let's come back to center and just be here with Deborah. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for joining us. That's my pleasure. Um, so we're going to dive right in. Thank you so much, Kelly. I really find that it um, just helps bring us together and make us present for, for these. So it's terrific. So here's what we're gonna do today. We have been running these COVID coping webinars for nine weeks now, crazy. And what I'm trying to do every week is sort of um, plug into 
what people are thinking, what we're talking about. Um, it's kind of like if you were having a cup of coffee over at Dottie's Coffee Lounge in Pittsfield and you put your feet up under the table and you go, so what do you think's going on? What's happening in small business? And we bring together panelists from different parts of the eat for all world to create a kind of interesting conversation about it. I don't have any answers. If I had a crystal ball, I would share it with you here, but I don't. But the thing that we're gonna talk about this week is regaining momentum and jumpstarting your business because at least here in Massachusetts, they're cautiously opening things. Um, I know that the same is true where AJ is, which is Pennsylvania, and I think the same thing is happening in Colorado. Um, but as business owners and managers, I think we may not be ready. We may have shut our doors. We may have been working halftime, might have been us and not our staff. How do you get the momentum going again? Um, and is it realistic to even think it's going to be exactly the same as it was before? So I don't know any of the answers. And uh, these three wonderful people are going to share their insights from where they sit and what they're seeing and hearing from people. So the format of this is I'm going to give them each about five minutes after I introduce them to just talk, tell us about who they are, um, what they was, were doing before, what they've been doing in COVID, and then just maybe a snapshot for a couple of minutes about what they're seeing. Are people hopeful? Are they still fearful? You know, I think we're past the emergency and panic situation, but what does it mean to be open? How are they feeling about that? When they've all talked, I'm going to bring it back and we'll start a conversation and hopefully they'll even have questions for each other about what's going on in their world and what they see. So without further ado, I am going to introduce them. If you have questions, I encourage you to uh, type them in the chat box. Vanessa is my able assistant today and taking care of the recording and she and I can screen them. We can either unmute you, you can ask your own question, or maybe we'll be screening them and, and offering them to the presenters. So enough from me, Bernadine Desange from Know Your Truth, Speak Your Truth. I love the name of your business. You may unmute and give us your uh, quick intro. Absolutely. Yes, but absolutely. Thank you so much, Deborah, for the introduction. And thank you, E for All, for inviting me to be part of this panel today. I'm really excited to share the space with you, Deborah, AJ, and Evan, um, and everybody else who's being super supportive and engaged. And hello to everybody who is part of this webinar. I'm excited to share space with you, too. Um, as Deborah said, my name is Bernadine DeSantis. I'm the founder and CEO of a consulting company and brand called Know Your Truth, Speak Your Truth. Um, and my company really focuses on curating brave spaces to empower our individuals to engage in difficult dialogues that will eventually lead to um, change in our institutional systemic ways of living life, particularly focusing on our racist infrastructures, discrimination, implicit biases, um, and that glass ceiling that a lot of our historically marginalized population of folks really feel exist. Um, I'm able to do this work working as a motivational speaker and a workshop facilitator. And on occasion, I blog and I also do write and perform spoken word poetry at a number of fundraisers and nonprofits profit events. And so it's been a great opportunity to be in business for a little over two years now um, and to curate spaces where we're all, you know, again, pushing ourselves to challenge our own our own narratives and how we came to be as people. My company focuses on unapologetically being oneself by prioritizing introspection through authenticity, transparency, and vulnerability. And so oftentimes when we talk about elements of life and oppression, segregation, discrimination, implicit biases, and the implications of that, it happens through um, our environment, right? How we've been conditioned to think and to process historical information and data will also yield itself to that understanding. And so I really focus on helping individuals to understand their own narratives and to speak their truths, understanding, you know, what parts of their stories and families have impacted them to be who they are and how can they then go out into the world and make change happen, whether that's intentionally understanding how you recruit and retain people of color, how we're pouring into ourselves as people of color when we deal with challenges around um, um, excuse me, um, I, imposter syndrome and challenges with race, um, 
<laughs> racial battle fatigue. And really, again, it ranges the gamut. But when it comes to, to me and thinking about the small businesses now and in, in being in these spaces, I think about how we've had to pivot. So a person like me, I'm in a unique industry, right? So I'm not in hospitality. I'm not in food industry. I'm not in, in tech or anything like that. Like my, my company is solely based off of being around people and being in spaces where I'm curating um, environments for a conversation, face-to-face -face interaction. You know, co companies and, and nonprofits and educational sectors will book me to come into these spaces and work with their professionals. And so when I think about my platform and, and the spaces that I've occupied, it was a struggle once I heard that we were in this pandemic to begin with, because right from the beginning, a number of my contracted engagements were postponed or canceled, given what was going on, right? Because we couldn't be in mass numbers around folks. This virus was spreading solely based off interaction, breathing, and people, again, we were just learning about it. As I think about where we're going now and slow, as the governor announced our, our slow process to reopening in these four state in these four phases, I'm still nervous. I'll be honest, right? Because as, as a speaker, as confidently as I can be in spaces with people, um, I'm constantly around people, right? That's what that would mean. I'm, I, I'm in spaces where I have 50, hundreds, thousands of folks in in my presence and I'm in their presence too. And I'd have to navigate from space to space, event, um, venue to venue to engage. And so I think about the spreading of germs. I think about the interaction. I think about people dealing with social anxiety now, right? So being in a position where you're forced, you're, you were forced to once stay home and now you're you're opening up your physical space again. I think some people might feel like I wanna, ret I wanna retract. I wanna kind of be in, in my own space. It's like, I don't wanna be around folks anymore. And so in my particular line of business, like I said, I have to be very mindful of human interaction and, um, you know, how did, how could I pivot my, my plans and my work? And so as an entrepreneur too, I, I've had to tra transition into the virtual spaces. And so I'm very familiar with Zoom, almost too familiar with Zoom at this point. <laughs> I'm like, this is just where we live and the spaces that we occupy virtually, but thinking about how can I still invite people to feel safe and feel empowered to be their most authentic and genuine selves in a virtual platform, in an environment where I can't connect with you based on your energy. I can't really understand exactly how you're feeling, but I'm going off of what I can see. And sometimes people engage by by turning on their cameras and sometimes people engage by, by showing up and by turning off their cameras and by muting themselves and not participating. So how do I, you know, make sure that everyone who's involved is still there? Um, and as we continue to evolve as, as companies and as, as business owners and as as entrepreneurs, I want us to think about what works best for our clients, what works best for our spaces. I think that the beauty in what I've been able to do um, is, is, is has lended itself to still providing participants and attendees comfort because we still engaging in difficult dialogues is not easy, right? Like that's why it's engaging in difficult dialogues. So being in I, I find that for folks being able to be in their own homes has been uh, has been a reward in some ways or has yielded them to feel even more comfortable to be more transparent to be more vulnerable because they're in whatever they want to wear or they might not be able to, they might not physically be showing their faces but they're they're sharing their their narratives they're sharing their stories and and they're showing up and they're showing out and they're still holding their their places of work accountable they're still holding themselves accountable and they're still holding their colleagues accountable. So again, it's a number of things. I think, again, in my particular industry, it looks a little different, but it's helping us to navigate how do we support each other virtually? How do we support each other in the physical? And how do we keep all of our clients and our partners in mind and what works best for them? So I'm looking forward and, to seeing and, how these phases come out. Yeah, Bernadine, can you uh, make any comment about what you think uh, you see with yourself as a business owner and other business owners? Do you think you know kind of what take their temperature what how are they feeling optimistic panic stricken um uncertain kind of you know i don't know what to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i think nine weeks later it's a it's definitely a bit different today i think in the very beginning people were in a place of panic right it was just like what are we doing how do we navigate through this i think right now what i've been finding from from colleagues and peers of mine is that people have have adjusted if you will so an example is is a colleague of mine who the founder of Empower Our Crown, which focuses on mental health and mental well-being. So she's curated spaces where every single Sunday 
Sunday, um, it's Self Care Sunday. And so she highlights an individual in the city of Boston or in a greater Boston community who's doing phenomenal work to help people find their center, right? So earlier we had Kelly help people to do that. So she's curating these spaces to, to, to encourage people to mentally check in with themselves and to unplug. Um, you have an, another organization, BECMA, which you know really focuses on the Black economics um, in, in Massachusetts. And they their, their newsletters, they've been utilizing their newsletters like crazy. Like all the time, I'm constantly hearing of local updates from the government, funding that's available to individuals to support their businesses, to sustain themselves. Um, when the PPP program was there, like they were, they were on it, helping people walk through like EIDLs, like and get these loans. So people are really being super creative. You have like the Ujima project who's creating spaces to support people in think tanks, right? So listen, you're in this moment right now, you're in a place of panic, you don't know what to do. So let's all come together and talk about how we're processing what's going on to find a sense of stability. So again, I think that there was a point in time where people were trying to quickly figure out how to navigate through this. And I think now people have found some type of like settling. Um, and then there's social spaces. So like Sheena Colia from the Colia Connection has curated spaces where every two weeks she puts on a virtual party and, ha and DJs have been doing their thing in the city of Boston, right? So like there's music, there's entertainment. Um, people are doing live paint nights and so again I think entrepreneurs have found a way to still keep their businesses and their and their their livelihoods in intact if you will right now knowing that we were slowly um we, we've been in this space space for a while I actually think it's going to be in reverse like when we're thinking about how do we go back out we're going to think about how do we curate these spaces still being very sensitive of the fact that people are going to be nervous being in these spaces. Um, I, so how, I think that's a, a, a key question and we will revisit <laughs> yeah. that. So Bernadine, yeah. I want to give the others a Absolutely. chance. I'm, I wrote a whole bunch of notes to come back and ask you about. Exactly. I'm now going to pass it off to AJ Drexler, who um, is with our partner organization, E Forever. She'll tell you a little bit more about herself, her, her organization and what's going on in Pennsylvania, which is where she is. So AJ, what are you seeing out there? You need to unmute, unmute. Unmute. There you go. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Uh, it's awesome uh, to be with you here today and to be exploring all of these issues, particularly with people uh, who are all over the country uh, among this group. Um, I am the CEO of E Forever or Entrepreneurs Forever. It's a program that was developed by the Mansman Foundation, which is headquartered here in Pittsburgh. E-Forever is a program that brings together uh, small business owners from evolving communities. Um, we, we curate, in, in uh, Bernadine's uh, wonderful word, um, uh, small, long-term peer-to-peer groups uh, that meet monthly to address all the issues that are involved with owning and running a business. Typically, these are entrepreneurs that have been in business for a year or so and have achieved a certain level of sales. So they've been in their business long enough to feel the pain of being in business. Um, and I, I can share that with this particular group because we all get that, you know, that, that sense of, you know, the burden and the responsibility and the joys of, of owning your own business. So we are currently working with uh, uh, nearly 100 small business owners. Uh, today, we're working via Zoom also, um, bringing those small groups together. So, you know, what has been really great about the, the Eat Forever model is that it automatically gives each one of our entrepreneurs this, this, this peer group, this small group of, you know, eight, nine, 10 other entrepreneurs who are sort of walking this walk together and trying to help each other figure it out. Um, so I think when we, when we think about the impact on our businesses, uh, you know, again, because there's, there's nearly a hundred, it's, it varies wide, widely, um, or wildly, I should say, um, what type of business they have and how they've been able to manage through this situation. So when, when things first started and actually our first, group meant via Zoom on March 16th. So yes, as we, you know, we start to talk like nine weeks, 10 weeks, as we start to get into this, it's a, it's a little, it's a little incomprehensible, but right out of the gate, our groups started to work through a model that basically, you know, in that moment of panic about, you know, what's going to happen. Um, we, we just honed it down to four key issues. You know, you have four choices, stay the course, scale back, pivot or close. And close is always an option out there. There are some situations where perhaps that would be better for an entrepreneur. So we, we keep that on the table. 
So as, as all of our businesses started to use that model, again, it was important to try to bring some structure or some, some way to think about all of the, the chaos that was happening and to think through what was the immediate, you know, the short-term strategy. What do I need to do right now? Um, to be honest, there were a few of our organizations who could si simply stay the course. And we'll, we'll talk about a, a few of them. But, but few of them were able to do that, that number one, yeah, we're just gonna ride this out. That, that was not the most common uh, reaction. Um, and also the fourth one about clothes. Right now, I only know of one business that has closed permanently. Um, and it was a maker who, who's still making, but the retail space for that making you know, has, has closed as of about last week. But other than that, everybody else seems to be able to, uh, seems to have been able to either scale back or pivot. Um, and so looking, starting right out of the gate to look at it that way and say, okay, you know, I'm a hair salon, I'm standing still, all of my, my employees are 1099 employees. I, I, they're, they're not here because my doors aren't open, but is there a way to continue? And so we have one entrepreneur who was able to continue with you know, her highest value service, which was hair extensions, and figure out a way to do that curbside and figure out, you know, so, so she had to sit down and structure that and figure that out. And that happened pretty, pretty smoothly at the beginning. You know, another one of our businesses, uh, to, to Bernadine's idea about bringing people together as an event planning business. And, you know, right out of the gate, cancellations, refunds, all of that mess that happened at the beginning, you know, and who knew how far out that was going to go. But similarly, she had to figure out, you know, what's my break even? What are the possibilities here? She had a piece of her business, which was a balloon business, and was able to, you know, invest some uh, money into materials she would need to do that and then figure out a way to have that balloon business maintain her, you know, just keep all the baseline expenses covered. So those are like examples of, you know, how to, how people were sort of, okay, what do I need to do sort of in the short term? We did, of course, have some businesses that actually had the potential to sell more product, you know, because they were either a food related item that was going into grocery um, or a business that makes yoga pants. So, I mean, there are, there, you know, those kind of things that, you know, the yoga pants that we're all wearing that nobody can tell because we're only showing the top of us. That's a great business model for her right now. Um, but the issue of production in a socially distant environment was a problem only having to be able to have half your people producing at any given time was a whole different problem for, for a company that actually could be expanding during that time. So, you know, and I think the early days was all about PPP too, try to, you know, how to get through that. So I think what's happened is that early stage stuff about how to, how to solve the short-term problem, how to maintain stability through what, you know, has turned out to be nine weeks. I think once that happened, everybody got sort of centered. Uh, let's use that word. We use emojis whenever each, each time our groups meet. Um, and the emojis started to be more, you know, veering on the side of perhaps a small smile, like everybody got a little stable. In the last several weeks though, as things have began to open up, it's a whole new level of anxiety, right? So the staff who've been laid off are now receiving unemployment and I can only get forgiveness if I bring them back, but I don't know that enough customers are going to come back to keep them back. And I don't want to lay people off again. And, you know, so all of these conversations are what are happening now. And I definitely experienced in the last month, this sense of, you know, I had just gotten stable where I was and I thought we were going to be okay. And now I have to reinvent this again because I can't just go straight back to what we were doing before. We, we, don't have, we, we can't open that way, but what do we need to do? You know, how, how do we sort of go back in? And, and we've been talking about sort of this new normal. Um, so we're using another model uh, right now to work through um, uh, how, to, how to say, this was my strategy during the crisis. This is my strategy as we come out. And can I start to imagine what new normal looks like? So that's, that's sort of where we are right now. Um, and, and that's what our groups do. They get together with one another and they try out those strategies on one another and say, okay, this was my position going in. I've altered it in this way. Coming out, I think I can do these things. And then they have a peer group to say, 
mm, I'm not sure that part's going to work. Or I think we need to find out, you know, what those opening things are for restaurants and entertainment venues and how they're different. You know, just sort of talking through that with one another to get to the next to get to the next level. So that's sort that's, of what that's that's a, a terrific introduction. And you again, lots of stuff to talk about. I want to give it to our last panelist for his introduction and his sort of take on what's going on now. And then we're going to have some time for conversation. I'll remind the folks who are attending that we welcome your questions. So just type them in the chat box and we will ask them for you. But first, I'm going to go to Evan Hung, which, who is out in Colorado. Um, he's an EFRAL mentor with our Longmont um, Colorado site. And Evan has personally had quite an impact from this, right? You were about to sell your company. Tell us more. Yes, indeed. Um, so yeah, my name is Evan Hung. Uh, I'm based out of Denver, Colorado. I'm the co-founder and COO of Nikola Power. We're a clean tech company that builds control software for energy systems that use a combination of batteries, solar, and grid power. So um, I think a lot of the points that I wanted to touch on have already been mentioned, so I won't belabor the points, but I do think that it's really kind of important to know that depending on where we specifically work, um, this COVID situation looks completely different for all of us. If we're in small business and we're dealing with retail, if we're dealing with you know, things that are more in-person events, that's a totally different mindset and set of problems than someone like me in the tech space, right? So for me, our day-to-day -day work um, in technology has not necessarily changed. Um, it's more about our focus, right? Our customers who are moving more slowly, you know, we can't necessarily address those, but what can we do as an organization in this time period um, to create more agility and nimbleness um, to be ready when the market is going to respond. Um, as uh, was alluded to earlier, my company was in the process of going through some M&A &A activity that was looking to close uh, in Q1 of this year. And because of COVID, that is not going to happen. So I think for us, it's you know, very, very unfortunate um, in, the, in, in that space. But I really believe in the idea that you can only control what you can control. Um, and it's not necessarily useful to, to over worry about the things that you can't. Um, so that really means, you know, the things that we can do to prepare, um, where do we go from here, like all of these aspects. And I think that, that that sort of sense of agility is something that all businesses can really respond to. I think that it's not really reasonable to expect that things will ever go back to the way that they were, because this, you know, way that they were is, is just, it's, it's an obsolete concept at this point. Um, it may be similar, and I would say if you've prepared your business to a point where it goes back to that, that point and you can kind of you know, build a better, uh, more efficient, lean business because of that, wonderful. But if there, and my, this is my, my hypothesis, is that there's going to be significant changes in you know, consumer behavior and market forces and all of these factors that are just out of our control, I think the best thing that we can do is try to get a solid understanding, a solid grasp of what's going to potentially happen um, not necessarily try to think that we have a crystal ball um, and do what we can to prepare the foundations of our business to, to respond accordingly. I mean, the, the way I kind of think about it is as business owners, we, we exist on the spectrum where we can make a really clear prediction, the world is going to go to here, X. And if you want to build your business for that outcome, fantastic. That's your prerogative. But if the world doesn't end up becoming that way, you're obviously becoming less well prepared um, for any of the other possible outcomes. Um, that the world is going to throw at us. So, you know, I think as a business owner, you have this power, more power than you think, right? Maybe not necessarily uh, the power to just you know, call customers and, and do business the way that you used to, but you do have a lot of power to prepare your business for the most optimal possible outcomes uh, moving forward. Oh, that was wonderful. You guys are uh, fantastic. I have one question and then we're getting uh, some questions from the panelists as well. I'm interested as people who interact with other business owners, right? So Evan's a mentor at Eve for All. Bernadine has her, her colleagues and, and AJ literally is talking to 100 businesses every day. How do you think about that next stage? Um, I'll just give you an example. I have a, a coaching client I was working with in the campground industry. And the campground industry has been in flux because people don't know, is it really affected because you live in your own trail? You know, you live in your own RV in a park they so want it to go back to the way it was. And it's just never going to be that way. They, and that's a very hard thing to swallow. But how do you adjust, as, as AJ said, uh, to figuring out what the new normal looks like? So 
there's a, a paint and sip on North Street in Pittsfield who's created take home kits. So she's going to teach you online and you can pick up your canvas and all the paints you need so you can watch her and do it. Is that her new normal? Is it, do people still want to come in person and drink? So who wants to take that one first? You can unmute and go. I can take a stab at it since I'm already unmuted. Okay, Evan, you're um, unmuted. Go right ahead. I think what I would recommend um, for businesses to do is to not make those assumptions because I think when you when you think about you know pro potentially providing another solution um, in this post-COVID world, um, it's really sort of a shot in the dark. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but I do think that there's stuff that we can do today to try to talk to our existing customers, to try to talk to people who are kind of in our space, um, prioritizing you know, that learning in this period to really create a solution that I think will be sustainable in a post-COVID world. I think it's totally fair to try new tactics, but you just have to acknowledge that there's an opportunity cost every time you try a new tactic. There's gonna be an investment in capital, there's an investment in time, there's an investment in kind of the direction of your business. So you just have to understand you know, when you try these new things out, that there's other things that you also could be doing. Don't be overwhelmed with the fact that you have so many choices, but be empowered with this idea that you have a lot of different places you can take your business. And then going back to what I was alluding, saying earlier, there's a lot of foundational work, you know, customer discovery, customer conversations that you can even begin. Even if you're not shopping at your store today, if you have the ability to access anyone who's ever loved your business or your product, that's a conversation that can yield some really useful intelligence um, to determine what you want to do uh, in the future. Evan, I, I just want to make a comment. I love your glass half full. You know, there are opportunities. There are things you can do. And I think that there has been some gloom and doom, like I'm a barber and I couldn't open the door, so there's nothing I can do. But in fact, there's always things you can do. You just have to seize the opportunity and do them. So AJ, I see you unmuted. Go right ahead. Well, and I think that is, that's the important thing is, you know, and I think about it more, not so much, uh, and I, I, I hear what Evan is saying about committing to one strategy or the other that could have, you know, consequences. So thinking about it as scenarios and thinking about it as possibilities, I think one of the things that our entrepreneurs have really benefited from is somebody else, you know, even, you know, spitballing and, and brainstorming with them saying, have you thought about it this way? What about this way? And so the idea of being able to say, like, who would have thought that the balloon business could have been big enough to maintain a business through time? Well, the consumer habits have changed. They can't go have a birthday party. They can't go to their grandparents' house. So they're sending stuff. So to Evan's point, it's some of, you know, expected or unexpected changes in the market and how do I adapt to that as I go um, and, and remain nimble enough to, to sort of continually pivot. But I think there is some degree of scenario planning that, that, that needs to happen in terms of saying, okay, here's where I am right now. There's going to be this transition time and there's going to be a new normal. And I don't know exactly what those look like, but I can look at other places in the country and I can think that through. Let's just go back to the hair salon. Georgia opened. When Georgia opened there for hair salons, for instance, there was very specific like way too much and very specific instructions about what you could and could not do. I didn't know until we researched it. You can't blow dry in Georgia because it sends the germs all over. You can only get your hair color washed if you have color. Like there are very, very specific things. So each one of our industries can find places now that are running a little bit ahead and just start to learn from them a little bit the big thing for organizations like that is that if you can only have one hair hairstylist and one customer in at a time, the revenue model breaks down. So how to do a break even analysis to figure out at what point in time can I open? How many people can I bring back and how many people can I serve and make enough money to keep this business stable till we get to whatever that new normal looks like? People desperately need haircuts. <laughs> so how we, how we figure <laughs> all that out. So, so I just use that as a model because it's one that's like really in flux. You know, the, the B2B, the, the business to business model, you know, the, most of those businesses haven't been impacted in the way they do their business, but, but to Evan's point, their customers have been. So that's, that's kind of how we've been talking about it and approaching it. I would, I would say, 
I would say I definitely would echo the sentiments of both Evan and AJ. I think it truly depends on your industry. I'd say to add to it, um, I want to encourage folks to really dig deeper into social media and social media platforms for engagement. I think that as business owners and as entrepreneurs too, like we can focus on what it is that we want to do. But this is prime time for you to engage with your clients, to engage with your consumers and poll people, like ask people, create a post of engagement, put out a newsletter, asking people for feedback, like, hey, this is what we do. What would be best for you as far as like giving you this product or reaching you and giving you access to what we have to offer or what does uh, pivoting look like? You know, again, it's like, how can we continue to please? Because it's one thing to be an entrepreneur and to be a business owner, but it, but our businesses, and yes, we're working for ourselves, but our business is solely based off of our clients and our consumers, right? And so how do you continue to support that consumer engagement? I think it's something that I would encourage people to do. Um, and so whether that's like on LinkedIn, if, if it's a professional platform for you, if that's on Instagram, Facebook, um, you know, people are doing TikToks for engagement, like whatever it is, if it's wearing your product, you talked about the yoga, you know, somebody who has yoga pants. So if it's a 15 second video demonstrating how flexible these yoga pants are, like, let, like put, like be creative and have some fun with it too. Um, I think that what's going on right now is, is, is count, counter, counterproductive, I guess, or um, in, in some ways to how we usually do our business models, right? So everyone was like, what's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? Like, what's going on? And I'm like, the truth about this pandemic is there is no five-year plan right now because we don't know what five years is going to look like yet. We don't even know what three months from now is going to look like because, again, these are all phases that are data-driven. And so the, like Massachusetts, for example, is open right now, but it's based on how many people are going to continue to get sick from this or not now that people can be out and about. And so being, yeah, I think to Evan's point earlier too, is being open to knowing that your, your approach may change and being flexible with yourself is very, very important when it comes to the work that you're looking to do. Um, and so if depending on your neighborhood, your town, your state, your city, whatever the case may be, I encourage all of us to also think about what, what, what are they governing saying what what is our governance saying things that we can or cannot do and then what are you then comfortable doing with what you can and cannot do so does that mean you need to downsize because you might be yourself nervous that you're going to have 15 staff members that you're not going to have to supervise all of a sudden after not necessarily having to do that like i don't know right and so i think that self-check is very important too for business owners during this time to figure out again like to what can like you know um deborah you mentioned somebody created like paint kits and people can pick that up so like that might be like a curbside service like are you an entrepreneur who has a space to offer curbside service or not like i don't know what works for you right like does, like are you having to now lease space to do this or not and so be, be really thinking about what's within your financial means what's within your personal comfort um in addition to what everyone else said and again really echoing the importance of of engagement from your consumers um because that makes a difference too like hearing from them about what works best is is only going to help you to win to determine again like what types of products and and, and levels of engagement we don't know kind of what the consumer sentiment will be like will people be ready to come out but i want to ask you another question while you're on bernadine and unmuted is because i think e for all is struggling with this and i'm sure that you are as well because so much of the power of your connection with people has been in-person events mm -hmm. and e for all is you know gone virtual this summer which is fantastic i'm really glad we're still reaching entrepreneurs but for instance in the berkshires we're struggling to think about the fall which is when our next accelerator is and it feels like, I don't want to say um, a cop out or it's like, is it, if I go virtual, have I lost too much? And, you know, I'm sure that you've been thinking about that a lot because, well, you're a fabulous big personality and I'm connecting with you here on video, but I'm sure being in the same room, I would want to give you a hug and I can't give you a <laughs> yeah. hug over the, over a video. I mean, yeah. that's really hard. And AJ, I want to talk to you about this too, because you had in-person groups and you've moved them virtually. Yeah. Well, I think I, it, it's, it's, Thank you for saying all of that too, because I think you're right. Like for me as an extrovert, I think again, it's like thinking about what works best for my personality as well. I get my energy from people, right? And so how do I make that happen and how do I stay afloat? And we're talking about these virtual hugs. And so I have moments where I'm like virtually hug this person. I use breakout rooms when it comes to Zoom because I think that while we have big spaces to engage, but it's the, the personal interactions are still important. So how do I emulate what drives people to my events in physical format and simplify it, if you will, or adjust it 
to a virtual space to really be able to allow people to feel as similarly as they would if they're in, in physical spaces. And so if I'm mailing you something to, to help you to feel engaged, if I'm mailing, emailing you something to help you feel more engaged, um, you know, if I'm acknowledging that this is the time I would give you a hug right now, I'm stating it ver like, like you just did, Deborah, right? So like helping to I, I hate, I, I personally don't like to say like normalizing because as a black woman in this world of business, like nothing about how we operated in America was great when it was normal anyway. So that's another day's conversation. So I'm all for let's figure this new thing out when we're more compassionate individuals and in humanity. So let's see. Um, right. Because again, <laughs> inequities are still very prevalent and we're seeing that in mass skills right now. But anyway, like as far as like, how do I continue to make that happen? It's, it's truly strategically figuring out how do I emulate what um, people really enjoyed in the physical spaces as much as I can in the virtual space to really provide people with that space for comfort. So letting them know again that they can be, they could show their cameras or they, or they don't have to, encouraging people, literally exactly what we're doing here, to engage in the chat, right? Um, again, providing opportunities for breakout sessions. When you're talking about the fall in the and it's just like, oh, is it a cop out? Um, I think again, it's, it's like right now in May is it may be too early to determine what 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 September is going to look like, what October is going to look like. But come closer to that time, reach out to those who would be part of the Berkshire program and ask people how comfortable they are. Pulse checks are ne necessary anyway, and I think that we need to have them even in the virtual spaces. Like, are these virtual programs too often happening too much? Right? Do you want to have a biweekly? Do you want to do weekly? Maybe you want to do them more often. I'm not sure i think again it goes back to asking people similarly to how we implement structures and systems right now we work on behalf of people without including people in our decisions so let's make it happen same similarly in the virtual capacity yeah, I, so much wisdom there and including i think that um i don't know how many of you have been on these zoom webinars that are atrocious just like not well thought out not well conducted nobody's moderating them there's no point of view so i think that we all have a lot to learn about how to do virtual meetings better aj i want to go to you because i know you have something to say here about getting together in person yeah you know it's funny because had you suggested to me in january that it would be a good idea to do peer-to-peer -peer meeting zoom i there's no way i would have thought that was a good idea like and i don't i don't know that anybody who you know has an, a face-to-face -face type of business um could have imagined that space but i think that what has happened at least in our situation is that the magnitude of the emotion that everyone was experiencing as you got dumped into this Zoom environment helped to facilitate a level of engagement and discussion that we could have never had if we just like wanted to try it for fun. Like, you know, that, that sense of the sky is literally falling and I am terrified got everybody right out of the gate, at least in terms of our entrepreneurial groups, to have these eight or nine people that were like, you know, burying their souls because they had to. That's what, and, and, and I think, I mean, it helped that they had those relationships pre-existing. To your point, starting brand new with a brand new group of people, you know, what's it gonna take to get to that level of vulnerability where it actually has value? Um, but for the groups that we were working with, I think it's an ideal situation. I hate to say it that way. That's not the right way to say it. But if you had to go Zoom, doing it under such duress pushed it forward faster than it would have happened otherwise. Um, having said that, I think most people who have face-to-face -face businesses are hoping to get back to them <laughs> at some point. I'm, I'm gonna ask the follow-up question because this has come up before. What do you think about doing some in person and some on Zoom. Does it have to be all or nothing for it to be effective? So here's here's what we're looking at. And again, you know, if you think about September to to Bernadine's point, you know, if if you would go back in time, you know, to March 16th and tell people what today would look like, uh, you know, nine weeks later, we wouldn't have believed you either. You know, so. I think where we're going is that it's it's all one or all the other. The part that that's really hard is to have some people live in the room and other people video. That seems to mess with people's interaction way more than having everybody be Zoom or everybody be in the room. 
So in a situation where you can't be socially distant and have eight people, you know, in any given space. I know our folks, I, I imagine that what's going to happen in the next month or so is that we're going to hear from our peer to peer groups that say we physically miss each other. And can we find a covered park area where we can be on picnic tables on the either side and just talk across to each other in a safe way, but in a way where we're experiencing the humanness of, of one another a little bit more closely. I'm expecting that that's probably where that's going to go. Um, but, you know, in, we, we are probably not going to advocate for that middle ground space because it leaves people behind. It's, it's a little weird. Evan, I want to actually um, take this to, to you because you have the background in tech. Is, you know, in the olden days, January, there were campuses for Google and Facebook and, you know, uh, Amazon. People literally worked in the same place. And now, like Jack Dorsey from Twitter saying, okay, you can work from home permanently. But does that change the nature of how people interact and um, sort of how a business is run if you're always virtual? Totally. Um, I think that companies can operate really effectively in a fully virtual capacity if they build their culture and processes intentionally from the very beginning to do so. So I think the really hard part is, is we're taking all these organizations that have had kind of partial remote culture or no remote culture. And now we're trying to replicate what we were doing in person. And I don't necessarily think that's the right solve. I do think that if businesses take a moment to step back and figure out what were all the things that they liked about the in-person interactions and the, you know, the, the kind of dynamic, organic, you know, drive-bys, let's go into a room and huddle on something. And you know, I think it's possible to create those types of systems and processes. Um, but I do think, you know, to, to my earlier point, you need a lot of intentionality behind it. Um, there's a phrase that I really love um, around businesses needing to slow down in order to speed up. And I think this would be a, a, an example of slowing down in order to speed up. But I think if we just try to, to do, again, business as usual, and, and, and I've, I've noticed like I have a really adverse reaction to that term because it just feels like this um, kind of clawing towards the past that's never coming back, um, then, then I think that we're going to struggle. You're going to see people burning out. You're going to see um, people not being able to be as productive. And, and also there's a whole uh, other component of it around like privilege. Like, do you have the ability to, you know, maintain an internet connection at home and have an ergonomic work set up and like separate rooms in your house? And do you have to take care of your kids? Like these are all factors that I don't think we usually think about in this. So kind of to that point of, of taking some intention around how do you build a culture that is remote friendly, I think all of those other aspects need to be accounted for as well. That's terrific. Um, there's a, a couple questions that, that came up and I'm going to combine them into one and have each of you check in on it is, all right, we're in week 10. Would you have told people to do something differently if you had an idea of how long this was going to last? And, and one piece of advice also that you would give to small businesses. Evan, you want to take it first since you're already on? Yeah, so um, I don't know if I kind of expected this would be really long. So at least for me personally, like I sort of like once it started, people were like, we're going to be back open in May. And I was thinking 2021 already. And I'm not certain why, but I think it has something to do with like historical pandemic uh, just trends. So um, I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that question. In terms of what small businesses can do, though, I do think that there's a mental model that I really love, which is what is the one thing that I can do this week to move my business forward? Or what is the one thing I can do this day today to move my business forward? And sort of using that as uh, an empowering mindset um, around the directions that you're moving your business. Now, the one thing I will acknowledge is that direction you're moving in is extremely uncertain. But I think if you remain really open-minded to what those kind of possibilities might be, and then you use that framework to really push your business forward every single day, um, that is probably the, the best advice that I could give um, for a small business owner. Thank you, Evan. <clears throat> Actually, it's interesting. I have a daughter who works for a nonprofit and early on they had a meeting about what happens if we're virtual from now on. And I thought that was like in week three. I'm like, that's a doomsday scenario. That's never going to happen. And in fact, it may be that people don't need offices anymore, that they can work virtually. You know, e for all had you know, what, 15 or 20 people working in Lowell and everyone else was working remote already. What happens if we don't need to reopen them? I, I don't know what that looks like. So AJ, you have any perspective on the, how long this is lasting? Would you have done anything differently or told people about anything differently? So 
yeah, I didn't go into it as as uh, as doomsdayish as Evan might have been with you know, 2021 out of the gate. But I did go I did go t a minimum of 12 weeks. I, I I right out of the gate it was whatever we're doing. I can see it being for three months. Um, in terms of sort of the counsel that that we've been giving and continue to give, I think the encouraging small businesses to have a strategy to to not to not necessarily just be buffeted about by the winds as they are as they are blowing. Um, you, it, you know, strategy is not about perfection and and not letting you know good be the enemy. You know, sometimes just making a decision to do something to to Evan's point, like take a step today to do something is better than not doing something. So, but but being intentional about that. And I think that's the best thing that we can help uh, our friends who are entrepreneurs um, sort of work through. It's just the idea of how do I think through what that next step should be right now? And can somebody feedback with me on, on that? Um, there's a really great tool that I'm actually using with some of our entrepreneurs right now. The Harvard Business Review is publishing a bunch of stuff that's free. Um, you know, it's all sort of COVID related. They've taken a model, um, the five P's, and they've adjusted it to the post COVID environment. You know, there's, a, there's a, an article about getting your biz business ready for post, for post pandemic. That little model, t t it has a little worksheet that goes with it. And it talks through the, what was my position before? What's been my position at this point? You know, what, who am I going to be coming out of this? Can I just restart or do, am, I, am I a whole new thing or am I this you know, curbside? You know, what does that look like? And then my best projections about, about um, going, going what, what new normal might be. Again, it's not, you, you don't have a crystal ball, so you can't tell what it's going to be. But thinking strategically about, I, I'm, a, I'm the entrepreneur. I've got to make these decisions. I've got to take a step and another step and another step just to prevent being immobilized. Terrific. Bernadine? Um, I'd say, I'd say, a, I'm trying to think. I'm like, I'd say a couple of things, but one is just like, be understanding that this moment is again, one where we know for sure right now that we are in the middle of a pandemic. Do we know how long this is going to go? No. And so I think if I were to think about back then and what I would say now is plan for both sides. You know, Deborah, you mentioned like what's going on in, in your daughter's nonprofit and like what if we're like this forever? I think people um, are doing themselves a disservice if they don't strategize and, and develop a, a plan for either way. I think that we need to really think and, and, and at the same time. So I would think about, well, what about your company, your nonprofit I mean, your, your entrepreneurial endeavor, whatever the case may be, is, it can sustain itself through a pandemic in a, virtual, in a virtual setting. And then like, what about it can work in a physical space? Um, you know, like AJ, when you mentioned, like you, you, you see like some challenges when you're half virtual or half physical, I'm actually figuring out, I, I'm trying to figure out how can I actually accommodate both at the same time so that people don't feel like they're losing from being in the, in the space or not. Because again, social anxiety may really be real. And sometimes people might want to support my events, but they physically, can't make it and realize that like maybe their child won't be able to join them but that doesn't mean they don't want to be part of it so I'm thinking more creatively like how can I make sure I accommodate for all types of people in a genuine way and so I would think for moving forward too for businesses is we continue to um realize that a virtual space might be a might be a new perspective or a new angle in doing things i want to encourage all of us to think creatively and collaborating across the country maybe you know like across industries so like somebody might have a business that is thriving in colorado and it has a partner or or somebody that they've admired in doing their work in massachusetts or in baltimore Now's your opportunity to figure it out. Like, why can't you merge your networks? Why can't you physically merge your spaces? Because I mean, you literally, you, you can't physically merge them, but virtually you can. So how can we, how can we collaborate and merge ideas, share ideas, share resources, um, share interests in a very realistic way that can still allow our, our, our endeavors to be elevated. Like this does not have to be a linear, like one-sided thing that's like going on in your current state, in your current house, in your current business. Like this is happening for all of us. So like how how can we make it work for all of us collaboratively to do? And so if you're, again, in an industry like myself where you're speaking, where, where I work as a speaker and I think about this pain and sip, like maybe I can perform or say something or provide some words of encouragement or something like that. And we paint around a concept. We paint around an idea. Like there's a way where you can, again, think that. about what your evolution <laughs> of your business can look like. 
That's great. Um, we are coming up towards the end. I want to just sort of summarize some of the things that I've, I've heard you guys say and give you a, a, an opportunity to, to sort of get in a last comment. But I think the main thing I'm hearing is waiting for, wishing for business as usual as it happened before is ridiculous. It's that's does that world will not ever exist again. I mean, I think even if they came up with a vaccine today, it would take 18 months for everyone to have it and for there to be the immunity. So I think anyone who's clinging to that as their hope for it's going to be back to normal, it's ridiculous. So you have to figure out, and I think some of the scenario planning that people have talked about on this call, you know, what will that new normal look like? Or what happens if this is the new normal. Um, and we continue to work virtually like this and we don't meet in person. Um, makes sense. And I think from AJ's talk, now I wish everyone could be in a, a pod and share, find other people to bounce ideas off of. Or as Bernadine has said, collaborate borrow ideas you know there's nothing new under the sun but um don't do things just to do them do them intentionally deliberately because they move your business forward or they're trying something new so that's some of what i've heard and and can bring back uh, hopefully as learnings for people who have been here or are just tuning in um who wants to give a final comment aj i see you unmuted go right ahead I just want to say I have a great takeaway from what Bernadine said that, that I hadn't really considered that I'm going to actually recommend to a lot of the businesses that we're working with. Ask your social networks, ask them. Just, hey guys, I'm in this situation. This is what I'm thinking. Instead of using them to promote, which is what we're all comfortable doing, what we're used to doing and curating the perfect story for what's going on with our business, being able to say, hey, if I, if, if I, if, if there was a choice of this, this, or this, which would you guys participate with me in? And use those networks. You know, a generation ago, people wouldn't have had those, those networks available to them to ask. Just that open sort of dialogue. And I think the idea of being authentic with where you are as a business and that you're interested in people contributing their ideas, I think that's awesome. So great. It will help people to be intentional if they can get that kind of input. It's just hard to do all by yourself. That's right. Don't, and you're not alone. I mean, we are in our all, own boats everywhere in the same boat, but let's connect with each other. Bernadine, a, a parting thought for us? Um, parting thought. One I would say is thank you all for continuing to invest in yourselves and in your businesses during this time. It's not easy. It's not familiar. Um, it's not something we can predict. It's not something we can continue to predict. So um, I'm grateful for you all to wake up every single day and say, I have a business to run and I'm running it. So give yourself a pat on the back for doing that um, because that's not always easy to do. Um, and then I would continue to further reiterate the fact that like you were, this is, this, is, this is a time where you have to pace yourself and be patient. Um, and patient, the patience might mean like um, you have a plan and you had a goal of what you wanted to accomplish in the next week. And that might not be able to happen right now, but that could happen in another week. That could happen in another month. And like being in tune with yourself. I think as business owners, we think about how do we sustain X, Y, and Z for other people. But I also think you have to think about how do you sustain yourself and how do you provide yourself with a level of mental check-in um, because you can't keep your business going if you are not okay. And it, it may seem cliche or it may seem like, yeah, we know, we know, right? You can't give to others without giving to yourself, but oh, how quickly we forget. And during these times, I, if I think about myself in the very beginning of this pandemic, I, I didn't even realize that I hit a funk and I was, and I was struggling with it until um, I realized like I wasn't keep continuously engaging with my audience and somebody checked in with me and was like where did you go and then I realized like I disappeared and I, I I needed it right I needed to recharge and I needed to really think about you know to Deborah's point really living with intention and not just putting things out there just for the sake of showing that I'm okay when I really was struggling like what does this even mean um, and so as we move forward I encourage you all to continue to check in with yourselves every single step of the way you are your business and your business is you but that's not there that's not all there is to you Great. And Evan, last thoughts? I don't really think I have much better than that. Uh, <laughs> I know, she really hit it out of the park. <laughs> do, your, do your thing, take care of yourself, and uh, just be proud of the fact that you guys are, are, are doing um, this really, really hard thing of starting a company and starting a business. Uh, maybe what I would say is 
um, try, it's very hard, but try to not be so focused on outcomes, right? And outcomes being like, if my business makes tons of money, that equals successful. My business fails, that equals failure. I think there's a lot of beautiful stuff that we can learn in this journey of doing something. Um, and if you, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, another cliche, but if you ask a lot of people who have experienced failure in all sorts of ways, there's a lot of times, a lot of beauty to be found there. I would even argue that within all of our own lives, if there are things that you appreciate about you know, where you are today, oftentimes it stems from a place of failure. So, you know, not to say that like, you're going to fail, like, you know, good luck and deal with it, but just like acknowledge that there's really a lot of, of, of uh, growth that we can have in this journey. And really that's what's exciting about building a business. Thank you so much. And thank you to Bernadine, to AJ, to Evan, to Vanessa, who was my tech person today. I really appreciate you. Um, thank you to the audience. We will be back next week. Um, maybe it's a little premature, but I'm going to do lessons from COVID <laughs> and silver linings. And I'm bringing back a really amazing panel that we had Morgan Smith from Longmont and John Lewis from uh, Ephraim in Berkshire County and myself to talk about what we've seen over the 10 weeks and um, hopefully share some more learning. So thank you to all of you. Thank you to the audience. Thank you, Vanessa. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>